guys. So, um, this chapter is on uh, electricity measurements, chapter six. So it's a new chapter. Uh, we're getting into the final throws of this class, and so I'm just trying to hit like the most important topics. Okay, it's cool. It's always hard to tell. <laughs> Justin just denies. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> okay, so uh, this first lecture is going to be on instrumentation for electricity measurement, and and the the rest of the chapter is I in my mind the vision of it. There, there are going to be three more short lectures. One on specifically the principles of current measurement the next one on specifically the principles of voltage measurement, and then the last one specifically the principles of resistance measurement. They're, both going to, they're all going to be pretty short, uh, and they all, uh, at the end of the day, come back to these. But if you don't understand like the principles, then uh, it's difficult to uh, use these instruments effectively. So I, I'm going to talk about the instruments and at a high level, how we can understand how they work and what we're measuring with them and the best one for each situation, uh, which I think is very important to know how to do. And you've gotten some of this in, in your lab, I hope. I mean, I know that that's the idea. So I'm hoping that you got that out of the lab. So this is, this is the, um, the idea of it. But we're going to uh, uh, start with the instrumentation. At a high level, let's survey the measurement of electricity. We begin with electricity because nearly every modern instrument or every modern measurement device has an electronic stage. So electronic measurement is fundamental for measuring most quantities. So you can't really measure anything until you can start measuring electricity because almost every single measurement device for everything is goes through electricity at some point. Now the one example that comes to mind readily is, is some scales, right? It can be purely mechanical. But almost everything else is going to have... Uh, yes, some are purely mechanical. Yeah. So you can, so you can get a, some purely mechanical uh, measurement systems still to this day. Um, uh, but they're getting fewer and further between, just because the electronics, um, well, the, the, the physical uh, uh, transducing of a mechanical quantity, typically mechanical for us, quantity into an electrical quantity, is often a, a pretty nice mechanism, it's well understood, and so, and also, we often want to measure things digitally and store that information. So we need to get into electricity at some point anyway. So uh, more and more things are going that direction. And what's happening is they're getting cheaper and cheaper and more and more accurate. So it's getting harder and harder to get away from it. It used to be that, oh, well, like an analog scale is going to be, like a, like a purely mechanical scale uh, or a purely mechanical um, uh, pressure gauge is going to definitely be way cheaper and more reliable. That's becoming less and less true as time goes on, and um, I would imagine eventually most instruments, except for toilets, will be um, no. electronic. Yeah. <laughs> about that. I mean, yeah. Seen but that's not really a measurement device. It could be. Or is it? Uh, okay. It <laughs> so, okay. Good. Uh, although many uh, modern measurement devices are digital, that is, sampled, we talked about sampling of signals, uh, uh, chapter two, I think it was, was sampling of signals, um, well, included sampling of signals, we first consider analog measurement techniques, the principles of which still apply to digital measurement and which are still in practical use in some cases. So sometimes we still will use uh, uh, analog measurements of even electrical quantities and not just digital sampled versions. Um, there are some cases where we still use that, although once again, it's disappearing slowly. More and more things are becoming digital. Uh, the fundamental quantities to be measured are current, voltage, and resistance. 
Um, really, current and voltage are the truly fundamental quantities we need to measure for uh, an electronic system. But resistance is so commonly important that we include it. I mean, you could also include capacitance, inductance. These are other quantities that are important to measure. But resistance tends to, to outweigh those in importance uh, by, by a large amount. Uh, so quick one-off measurements of these quantities can be performed with a handheld multimeter, which can be either analog or digital. So at right, we have pictured a Fluke multimeter. Um, and you guys have been using, this is like a picture I took and it's from the lab. Um, you guys have been using like literally these. So I expect that you would kind of understand these in the lab. Um, you guys have been using them. But we're going to talk about them uh, just a little bit. Um, so a multimeter has different modes for measuring a current, voltage, or resistance. To measure voltage or resistance between two nodes in a circuit, the multimeter's two probes are simultaneously contacted with them. So you notice there, there are these two wires connected here. Um, this is the, the common or ground, and then this is the... Uh, the other one. So it, you have three options. The <laughs> other one. I know. <laughs> uh, so you have three options for where you place that. Uh, it, it's either in this port. In, in this port, you're going to be measuring voltage and and uh, resistance, and also you can measure diodes. And I think I don't know if this one can do capacitance, but sometimes capacitance. And it's also in this in this one when you do capacitance. The other connections are the least uh, are, are less frequently used than the voltage and the and the uh, resistance measurement connection. Um, so these terminals correspond to current measurements, and there are two of them on this one. Sometimes they don't have two. This is just like a selector, but um, there are actually two on this. And the idea is this one is the, what. You connect it to this one if you're going to measure high current, and this one if you're going to measure low current. Um, and mainly the, I, the difference between them is that there's a different size fuse. So if you start running high current through this one, it blows a fuse so that it doesn't damage anything. Uh, if you start running high current through this one, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, blow, it doesn't blow a fuse until you hit 10 amps, um, which is quite a bit to send through a multimeter. But... The power line. Try not to send 10 amps through a multimeter if you can help it. That's generally advisable to avoid. Uh, well, it's fused, so I, I, I would guess, I don't know what the fuse goes at. 10 amps max is probably, it gives you a little buffer. It's probably like, you probably, yeah, factor of two, wouldn't be surprised, 20 amps will blow. At some point, you guys know what a fuse does, right? What does a fuse do? It heats up, and when it gets too hot, it burns. Yeah. yeah. And then when it burns, what does it stop doing? You take it Conduct. out and jump it across with a set of pure wires. Right. That's, yes. Yeah. That's how you debug a blown fuse. Yeah. <laughs> you jump it across with a wire. So it doesn't blow anymore. It just sends it along. First, first you have to remove the toaster from the bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I know pop tabs. Really a problem with motor I just wired no, up things. I've done that. I just wired up things. OK. Yeah, yeah. So fuses essentially are there so that you don't run too much current. Because if you start running too much current, usually that means something's wrong. Like you dropped, you dropped the toaster in the bathtub. Something's wrong. Okay, so. <clears throat> Sorry, that's really a bad joke. I really shouldn't use that joke. Hair dryer. Hair dryer. It was something you could feasibly drop in a bathtub for on accident. Right. And, and not. Or, no. your, or Although, your phone as it's plugged into the charger. A phone, that makes sense. A phone, phone. yes. Yeah, that actually happened. If you're taking a also, bath, also, phone. something to mention, though, is that, that you guys know how bathroom uh, outlets have those GFI yeah the GFI outlets on them uh, so 
those are there to be an extra protection against overcurrent, and yeah. it's because there's house, water in there. Every room in my house has one that shuts off the rest of the outlets in the room. Yeah, that's, I think, code now. My house is old, so it doesn't have that. Yeah, but the one old. that I have behind my couch that I plug my phone charger into, I accidentally hit the button with the prong to my phone charger sometimes, mm -hmm. and it kills everything in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> my Wi-Fi dies. <laughs> Yes. So, anyways, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, uh, in general. There are these different modes that you can be in. So the selector tells you measuring DC voltage, AC voltage, small DC voltage, resistance, diodes. You can me measure a diode. You can also measure current, uh, uh, AC and DC, at the higher um, uh, uh, scale and at the lower scale. Some uh, multimeters have auto scaling in them, so some of the nicer multimeters in the lab have that, so you don't have to do some of the selecting, which is kind of nice. It's for Sorry? It's for clears. It's for clears, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Just like break. Yeah, it's for, <laughs> exactly. And stopping smoking, yeah. Um, so. <laughs> don't smoke <laughs> It's for quitters. So to measure, uh, uh, good. So it has different modes for measuring these different quantities. To, so uh, to measure mo uh, voltage or resistance between two nodes in a circuit, you put the two probes simultaneously contacted with those two nodes. So say you're like, here's a resistor in a circuit, and I want to know what the voltage is across it. So you put one of the probes, so one of the probes would go there, the other probe would go there, and you would be able to measure, if you're in the right mode over there, um, the voltage between this node and this node in the circuit. You can do the same thing with resistance, um, uh, but you know, you got to be careful uh, with this because if your resistor is in the circuit, then of course there are other paths potentially between these two nodes, right? So if you want to measure that resistance, you can't connect it to the circuit where it has, like, say, another resistor in parallel with it and expect you're going to be measuring just this resistance, right? You're measuring the effective resistance of these two resistors in parallel at that point. So something to keep in mind uh, when you're using these. And you guys have been using them uh, fairly regularly, I believe. So to measure the current through a circuit element, I don't think that we've had you in the lab do this. It's mostly just been voltage. Uh, the multimeter itself must be placed in the circuit such that current flows through it. So in this case, uh, when you're measuring voltage or resistance between two points, the circuit connects into the, to the multimeter here. Um, like that. And in between these two, for the voltage measurement, this is a really high resistance, okay? So it's 5 mega ohms or 10 mega ohms or something like that, something very high. The idea is that you're not, you don't want to draw current through this when you're in voltage measurement mode or resistance measurement mode because if you do that, you're going to change the voltage you're trying to measure. So you don't want to do that. So you, you, you don't want to load the circuit by connecting up your meter to it, right? You want the measurement of the voltage when the meter is not connected. That's kind of the idea. You know, like, oh, I wonder, I wonder what the voltage is between those two points when the meter is connected. It's not really the answer you're looking for. You're looking for is what's the voltage between those two points when the meter is not connected because that's when it matters. So, okay. But when you want to do the currents, um, what you do is you do something similar, but so in, say you had a new circuit and you were like, here is, we'll make a full circuit, not just a fragment. We'll do like an RC circuit situation. And the question is, what is the current? So you want to measure the current. Uh, you can't simply probe uh, two places on this circuit 
and uh, have a high impedance path for your meter at that point. What you have to do is kind of the opposite. You break into the circuit. So we'll, let's break in down here because there's like an empty spot, right? So we'll break into the circuit and my eraser work. It wasn't working. I don't know why it's not working, but um, we'll break into the circuit down here. And we're going to we're going to put the meter in between these two points so that it has so that the current has to flow through the meter. OK, so now my probes. So I break it open and then I put my probes here. And then I go into the meter. Now, if I put this through a, a high impedance path like I did with the voltage measurement, um, I'm going to significantly affect the current that's going to flow, right? If you just put like a big old resistor in series with something, you're going to really affect how much current flows through it. Um, ideally, we th we actually have no resistance here. It just passes this right through, and we somehow measure what the current is that gets flowing through. And in fact, there are um, different sensors that you can do that sort of thing. We'll talk about them um, to a very small extent, uh, but. At, at the very least, we want a very, very small resistance, like boop, very small resistance. Um, and so that's why we actually physically have different terminals for these two different measurement modes. One terminal goes through a really low impedance path. The other, so these two have a very low impedance between them and COM. Ideally, they're like almost just a wire, right? I mean, it's not quite ever the case, but it's, it's approximately true for a really good one, right? Uh, whereas these ones have this big old resistor in between them. So that's why we have two different paths. Now, if you had like a really advanced device, it, you could switch back and forth between modes without having to actually disconnect and connect. But this one is a pretty standard version. The multimeter has been around for a while, and it's pretty pretty uh, uh, well worked out how to be effective. And this is, you know, it's nice, it's very standard fluke uh, multimeter. So, um, good. So in the former case, uh, okay, so to measure the current through a circuit element, the multimeter itself must be placed in the circuit such as the current flows through it. In the former case, so when we're measuring voltage or resistance, it is best for the multimeter to have high input resistance such that it draws as little as possible current through itself, and thereby affecting the measurement. So we don't, we don't want to draw current. This is, this is bad when we're doing voltage measurement. We do want to draw current. We want it to pass right through um, in the case of, of a current measurement. Okay. Uh, good. Precision, typically benchtop, or multimeters are available that can reduce the uncertainty in one-off measurements. So you don't see these as much, but they do. They are out there. So you can get a really nice benchtop multimeter, and they're essentially just um, they have. If you look up in their data sheets, they're going to have smaller errors in the measurements that you get, which mostly corresponds to having well. Uh, isolated voltage inputs and and uh, uh, really nice conduction there without affecting so essentially you're affecting the circuit very little you have a lot of, of uh, resolution and yeah so, so a really nice multimeter uh, comes in a benchtop form we don't have any in the lab right now that I've seen um, so I, I don't have an example to show you guys they're not as common to see um, and that's in part because of some of these later measurement devices that we have. Uh, they're really for one-off measurements, though, even the benchtop ones. They're like, oh, okay, what's the resistance of this resistor? Bam, let's look at it. So even the benchtop ones are, are, are for that. Specific aspects of an AC electronic signal can be measured with a multimeter. So we're still on the multimeter. 
Most commonly, just the RMS voltage or current can be measured. So there are a lot of aspects to an AC signal, of course, sinusoidal signal. Um, and mainly what it's going to give you is the RMS value. And remember, the RMS value is essentially the average if you uh, uh, take the absolute value of it. It's not exactly that, but you can think of it as that. So as the amplitude goes up, the RMS value goes up. Um, for a sinusoid, it's something like, I forget, it's like the square root of 2 over 2 times the, times the amplitude. Some, something like that, or, yeah, it's just 1 over uh, square root of 2. 1 over square root of 2 times your uh, voltage, yeah. voltage peak. Yeah, voltage peak. Yeah, so, so our regular amplitude times, or divided by square root of 2. Or 0.7 Yeah. So that's the, that's the uh, RMS value for, a, for an AC signal, a sinusoid. If it's a perfect sinusoid, that's what it is. If it's not a perfect sinusoid, then you have to use the other formula for it. So, uh, however, these measurements have significant limitations, including their effective frequency bandwidth. So, they're really not made for just any AC signal. Most of them are made specifically for a 60 hertz AC power transmission signal, which is the vast majority of AC signals that need to be measured, but it, it does have that limitation. Um, typical inability to indicate the signal frequency, a really fancy multimeter might tell you what the actual frequency is, like, oh, this is like 65 hertz, or this is whatever. Um, it's not uh, typical for one like this to be able to indicate that. And uh, finally, it lacks um, information about the signal's noise. So if it's a, just an AC signal, um, at very best, it's, it's going to be noisy, right? So. But you could have like significant distortion in the AC signal, and the the multimeter is not going to tell you that. It's just not made to do that. So, um, so it has limitations. It's good for uh, a lot of measurements for AC signals, but it's not good for every aspect of AC signals. So the multimeter's wheelhouse is the is the DC signal and the standard 60 hertz AC power transmission signal. That's where the multimeter is. That's where it shines. That's what it's made for or those applications. It's really good at those. I mean, for one-off quick measurements, can't beat it. It's great. Now, time varying analog and digital voltage signals, including DC, AC, and to some extent other, so DC being a sort of line offset, right? Uh, uh, AC being sinusoidal, and other being like, for instance, the transient response of the, the motors that you guys have been using in lab, uh, the signal that comes from them, like the, the signal like this. That's neither AC nor DC, it's just a time varying signal that you want to measure. Um, so um, uh, an oscilloscope is uh, the way to go uh, there. So it can be viewed effectively on an oscilloscope, a photo of which is shown in figure 6, 2. So this is one from the lab, a Tektronics oscilloscope, my favorite brand, but there are some other good brands out there. Um, these are, um, they come with different channels, so channel 1, channel 2, usually they go up to 4 channels you can get. And uh, also, there are digital inputs on some of these models as well. And you can usually do a lot more of those. Usually there's like 16 or 32 or 64 digital inputs. Um, nowadays, these are all digital. So they're all sampled and then represented on a screen, just an LCD screen. Back in the day, it didn't used to be like that. And they used to have that electrons actually going across screens and stuff. But Alas, those days are gone. <laughs> they're still around. We have some around. I recommend playing with them because they're like 10 times more fun to play with. So. Do you concentrate the beam on one spot for too long, you will burn out by the screen. Really? I've never done that, but I believe it. Uh, okay, so these devices effectively show a trace of a signal across a time window. If the window is properly triggered, 
such that the window starts at the same point in the periodic signal, in the periodic signal, it will trace approximately the same path across the window, which is kind of like the secret sauce for the oscilloscope, okay? This gives the illusion of zooming in in time and viewing the signal across a viewing window of, say, a couple milliseconds. So if you have a periodic signal, so oscilloscopes really shine for periodic signals. Um, they can be used to view a transient signal that's changing and never repeating, but really it's all about periodic signals. Um, so it allows you to, to, say, look at a signal that um, drawing on there is not going to be very effective. Uh, so, say you have a sinusoid with a, a period of like one millisecond. And you want to look at the signal on an oscilloscope. Um, that's a pretty quick thing that happens one, in one millisecond. Um, so if you were to just like have like a moving window that was showing you things, um, that move window would be moving quite fast, and the one millisecond thing, phew, it would be like gone. You wouldn't be able to see it happen, right? So what the, what they do is really brilliant. I mean, it's a really brilliant idea. Um, say, okay, let's let's have let's trigger it so that it represents that thing flowing across the screen, and then and, and then the one millisecond thing will happen, and it'll come back to this point. And let's say that, that that's the size of the window. Then it's going to take this and loop it back to this side of the screen and match it up so that it flows, this trace goes across the screen again. So it's a little bit like, you guys remember the mouse pointers that like left a trail behind? Back in the day when you would do this and it would go across. Or, or, ooh, ooh, even better. I don't actually know if hockey is a good reference. <laughs> <laughs> but but remember the hockey puck for a few years? They had that like blue tracer on it, so you could see where the hockey puck went on TV. Nobody knows that. Oh my god. Okay, hold on. That is true. <laughs> uh, hockey puck tracer. I could just show you an oscilloscope, but showing you hockey puck is. They do it in baseball now with pitches. Do they? So you can see how the pitch moves. Yeah. That would probably be more relevant an example. Yeah, they, they do that now with pitches. That, they'll replay the pitch, and it'll show you the path of the ball. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's actually pretty cool. Like the old school hockey people Let's really, really hate it. Like, <laughs> so why did that ever go away? <laughs> I, I guess the hockey people were like grumbling about. Looks stupid. Like kids these days, days and their technology. I don't know. So anyways, it's, they don't seem to use it anymore. I think maybe because we've got HD. Is that maybe why? So you can see the puck better? I still can't see the puck. Yeah. Because back in the day, like, can you imagine on standard definition television watching hockey? You wouldn't even be able to see the puck. It would just be like guys standing there with a stick and just, and then you'd have to like see how people react. Unless it was white and white, then you'd probably That could be. So yeah, you're, you're, uh, the idea though is that it fades, right? There's a trace that fades. And if you keep tracing it over the same thing over and over again, it looks like it's standing there, right? So sort of standing wave. So you can sort of stretch out time by letting it cross itself over and over and over again. So as long as you have it properly triggered, if you don't have it properly triggered, it's just gonna look like a mess flowing by on the screen if it's a high frequency signal. And then you're like, oh, I need to trigger it. And that is the trigger on this all happens in this little menu here. Play with that. I think there was a lab on that to play with the oscilloscope. Um, in any case, that's the idea with the oscilloscope. Um, those are pretty cool. So uh, oscilloscopes are mostly practical for debugging and one-off measurements. Okay, so they're really not like a data acquisition device. You can kind of use them as a data acquisition device now because they're all digital, so they have these functionality where you like plug in a USB stick um, and it'll just, it'll actually like save screenshots essentially of the trace and data points to the thing in some file. Or does it do like actual data 
It'll do data log. I, I, I said screenshots, but essentially it's like uh, it'll do like a like a trace of a signal in in data points. So it'll do that. It'll dump it to a file for you, um, and you can also get those sometimes. Uh, so there's USB and um, GPIB or HPIB, depending on the area you're from. Ports on most of these, um, and these. Uh, these are communication that was in USB. Everybody is familiar with GPIB is a little older, but they have like networks essentially uh, that have certain uh, uh, standards for communication on them. So you can like you can use those to communicate with these oscilloscopes, and you can use USB nowadays to communicate with these oscilloscopes. They'll send you data from them now. So like you can kind of use it as a data logging tool now. Although I would say that hasn't seemed to have caught on all that much. Like I've done it a little bit, but it is a little like clunky to do. It's not, I don't know, in my opinion, even the good ones don't do that part that well yet. We used to out, uh, export the data, the quick deck, straight from the oscilloscope mm -hmm. from my solids lab. Right? Yeah. We used the oscilloscope a lot and just export the data from the oscilloscope and the quick deck. Yeah, I mean, it, it works. Like, in a pinch, if you're like, I, I want to see, I want to, like, dump out voltage data. Your professor's data. 60 years old and only knows how to do it that way. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a way to go. I mean, it really, it's, it's not bad. It's, like, it's a quick and dirty way to go. Like, you don't have to worry about interfacing with it that much. You just dump it to a file, USB stick. It's not bad. It's, like, kind of, to me, it's, like, a halfway in between. Like, you're, like, I want, I want a one-off measurement in the sense that I want it to be like sort of like easy, quick and dirty, just get this measurement. Um, but I, I also want to log data. <laughs> it's like kind of a happy medium. Um, data acquisition is what we're gonna talk about next. That's what you need to really go to if you wanna get a lot of data saved and, and, and stored and to use later. That's the direction to really go with it. But um, as an in-between, just using the scope to dump data to a file, it's not bad. So, yeah, they're super fun. Oscilloscopes are one of my favorites. So, for repeated continuous stored measurement signals, so repeated multiple measurements, continuous, like you want a stream of these multiple measurements, often at a specific time interval. Uh, stored, meaning that you can actually save these things and have them not just like fly by you as like a viewing window or something. Uh, measurements of signals, so DC, AC, and others, so like transients or really any sort of signal, um, it is now standard practice to use a digital data acquisition device that includes analog to digital conversion on board. So a plethora of microcontrollers, which are sometimes um, denoted mu-c, uh, are now available for such measurements, ranging from inexpensive and inaccurate to accurate and expensive, which is kind of the usual thing, right? So you can get like a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to like say anything negative at all about Arduino, but Arduino boards, they're super cheap. They're really easy to use. The accuracy that you're gonna get from an analog input in like a, a an Arduino board that you get off of Amazon for 20 bucks, probably not gonna be super great. But it is, I mean, honestly, it's getting better and better. So like, you know, I say that today, two years from now, it'll probably be like twice as good or 10 times as good or 40 times as good as it is today. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting better. And so like the cheap ones uh, can give you relatively inaccurate or at least Maybe they are accurate, but you don't have a lot of, of uh, data on how accurate they are. So you have to just assume that you have a, a large uncertainty associated with it. Um, they're not always super well documented, but they're super easy to get going. On the other side of the spectrum, you can go to like really expensive uh, dedicated data acquisition boards. Um, when we're talking six figures, they I mean a handful of years ago, they were millions. Uh, they're crazy. So they're highly flexible and accurate, and you can get really good data acquisition um, from them. And, and the, the more expensive ones, I would say, uh, 
when you get up to six figures, mostly you're paying for speed at that point. So if you don't care about speed that much and you just want accuracy, you don't need to go that high. Like much, much, much lower, you can get accuracy. But it's the speed that is expensive still. So keep that in mind. Although that's also changing with FPGAs, which we don't have time to talk about. But those Myrios have FPGAs on board, and they do stuff really fast for cheap, relatively cheap. Uh, that has nothing to do with the FPGA, but yeah, that is annoying, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so it is notable that most data acquisition boards have analog inputs configured to measure voltage only, okay? So unlike the, the multimeter, uh, which could measure like current or, or uh, uh, resistance, it's really set up to just measure voltage. That's all. Um, therefore, if one wishes to measure current or resistance, a separate sensor is required. Okay? The crudest current sensor is simply a resistor with a known resistance placed in series with the element through which one would like to measure the current. So if you came up here to our little figure that we drew, and you were like, you know, I can only measure voltage, and I just have my data acquisition. I don't have, I'm not using a multimeter. I'm using my DAC board. And I want to measure the current flowing through um, this circuit by measuring a voltage. Okay, uh, I just stick, you just stick a resistor in there, and you measure the voltage across it, and back out what the current must be through it. The obvious there are some obvious problems with this, so we'll talk about that. Um, uh, the crudest, so it's it's just sticking a, a, a resistor in series. Um, with the element you would like to measure the current through. Measuring the voltage across it and hitting the result with your automatic reveals the current. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. So just Ohm's law, right? It gives you the current. The resistor as current sensor has two distinct disadvantages. One being that, as with the multimeter, one must break the circuit in order to flow current through the resistor or sensor, so you have to like open up the circuit, stick a resistor in, right? Which is kind of inconvenient. Um, and two, the resistor's inclusion in the circuit, and this is the biggest problem, uh, will affect it by assuming it's not fighting a controlled current source, reducing the current flow, and dropping the voltage. So you're affecting the measurement by using this resistor in the circuit, which is not ideal, right? And then the larger the resistor, the larger the resistance, the uh, uh, more you're affecting it. But also, when you get to a smaller and smaller resistor, uh, your, your uh, ability to measure the voltage across it is going to get less and less accurate. So it's just not, it's not ideal. Uh, in any, any way that you cut it, it's not ideal to stick a resistor in there to measure the current. Um, Okay, so much better current sensors exist, such as the Hall effect sensor. This is typically an integrated circuit. So an integrated circuit, of course, is a microchip, right? It's just like a little tiny uh, uh, chip that you could put on a board, right? So they're often very, very tiny. I mean, a couple millimeters on the, on the side, okay? Very small. Um, so uh, so it's, an, it's an integrated circuit with a, a current pass-through that sees less than uh, uh, a single milliohm of resistance. So it passes current through it, and the resistance path of that current is like less than a milliohm, which is pretty awesome. Um, and also, you know, how expensive is one of these Hall sensors? Pennies. I mean, if you got buy it on a board, it's like dollars, but like a couple <laughs> is all, so. You can buy these on a, on, so these integrated circuit devices, there's these tiny little chips, and they have these pins on them. And you guys have seen them in the lab uh, a couple times, I would, I would think. Uh, and they're, they're not very easy to use in a sort of prototype situation, because this is something that would go onto a board. You would need to design a full uh, uh, board in, in order to integrate this into your larger circuit. 
And most of the time we don't want to uh, build a full board just for a little measurement in the lab. So what they make are these nice breakout, they call them breakout or evaluation boards. Um, and these breakout boards are wonderful little things. They put them on a board, they often put like the basic uh, uh, circuit elements on there that you'd need. Like sometimes there needs to be like a pull-up resistor on this, or there needs to be a whatever on that, or a current prote overcurrent protection on it. And they usually include those on the board, and then they give you nice uh, uh, pinouts so that you can solder to them or jumper, cable, jumper wires into them. So you don't have to try to solder onto this tiny little microchip. Much, much nicer to work with. So I really recommend when you get a sensor, get it from a lot of the stuff that we're going to do for prototyping, get it on an evaluation board. You have to spend, I mean, they're like, instead of paying pennies for the microchip, you pay a couple bucks for the board but then it's much more usable for a prototype. When you, and you incorporate it into a final product, you would probably want to take that integrated circuit and put it on a dedicated board. But for prototyping and for measurement stuff, for most measurement stuff, you can stick to this type of sensor where you have a breakout board. So you're going to run the current through it, and it's going to only see like a, a milliohm, which is like the same resistance as a wire of any length. <laughs> so. It's really not that bad. Um, and it works using the, the Hall effect, which is really cool, and I really recommend you look into it. It's essentially uh, uh, measuring the magnetic field coming off of the current flowing through the wire. So let's do it. OK, so it outputs an analog voltage approximately linearly proportional to the current, ready for a, a data acquisition board, analog input. So you put, you put current through it, and you get out a voltage, which is exactly what you can measure with a DAC. So that's, that's wonderful. Other current sensors exist that can be clamped around a wire to measure the current through it. Um, they can use the Hall effect. They can use different principles. There are a few other physics principles you can use to measure current through a wire. Um, and they're nice to use as well. Um, I would say the Hall effect sensor is definitely the workhorse right now. That's what the sort of standard people use. Um, inexpensive and effective. There are several ways to measure resistance uh, with a data acquisition board. Probably the easiest way is to put the unknown resistance in a voltage divider with a known resistance and backing out the unknown resistance value from the known input and output voltages and the known resistance. So essentially the voltage divider circuit tells you the relationship between an input voltage and output voltage and the two resistances that you're dividing the, the voltage across, right? If you know the input voltage and the output voltage and the, one of the resistances, you can solve for the other resistance. And that's how you can measure the, the resistance of one of the, uh, or an unknown resistor um, from a voltage measurement. So a DAC would want to use a voltage measurement and you can do that using a, just a voltage divider. Pretty effective way uh, to do it. Um, pretty easy way to do it, too. So another is to measure the voltage across and the current through, so using, say, a Hall effect sensor, the unknown resistance, and then letting the ohm g regulate. So this is, I feel like, a more obscure reference. Nobody in here but like. Warren G. Yeah. Warren G. Regulators. Uh, it's worth a Google search. Okay. So there are also these special devices, typically benchtop and expensive, that are like the alter ego of oscilloscopes, called spectrum analyzers. These show real time, quickly updating, fast, and implicitly discrete Fourier transforms of signals on a screen. So you know, remember how we did all that Fourier transform stuff? We showed the spectrum of a signal. It does that like on the fly for you, for a signal you're feeding to it. It's just pretty cool. Uh, more band limited spectrum analyzing functionality has relatively be recently become available in higher end oscilloscopes. I think it's reasonable to assume this la label coinage will stick spectro oscilloscopes. 
I love it. I googled it, zero hits. This is coinage. It's just happening before your eyes right now. Okay, spectro oscilloscopes. Watch it catch on. It's going to be a thing. And then OMG is the final is the final thing about that. So uh, I, one thing I didn't mention: is spectrum analyzers, the benchtop ones. Uh, oh, yeah, I did say they're expensive. They are. They are quite expensive. Like tens of thousands of dollars for a spectrum analyzer. But these nice, uh, um, like even uh, apparently our our uh, Tektronix oscilloscopes have this ability to do the spectrum um, in real time. They're, they're kind of band limited compared to the ones that you can, you know, the expensive ones, but they still do it. So it's pretty cool that you can do that. So I recommend it. So you put in like a, a 20 hertz sine wave um, and you look at the spectrum. So I'd recommend doing that, just going in there, you know, sticking from the function generator right into the oscilloscope and seeing uh, what the spectrum looks like. You should see something like very little at low frequencies, and then when you hit whatever the frequency is, so say it was 20 hertz, so you hit 20 hertz, you should see a peak there, and then it will flatten out again afterwards. So if you just put in a pure sine wave, you would see something like that, which is the frequency domain understanding of a sine wave, right? It's just zero, and then there's a peak at the frequency of the sine wave. And then if you put in more complex, let's say you added two sine waves, one at 20 hertz and one at 30 hertz, you would have another peak that happened here, et cetera. So anyways, good stuff. So this is the instrumentation aspect. And you've pretty much now hit all the highlights for measuring uh, instruments for electricity. So all right, see you guys on Friday. <laughs>